Hey guys, how are you doing? Okay guys, so did you like the cotton candy frappe last week? Yeah? Okay, well Tiana has something to tell you about this week. We have a new drink of the week. Hey guys. So everybody know, knows that Elvis is the king of rock and roll, but he was also known for his love of peanut butter and banana sandwiches. So this week we have a frappe that has peanut butter and banana syrup. Um, you can use any base for this, but we recommend coffee or vanilla. Um, and it has Reese pieces in it and on top, as well as whipped cream and um, peanut butter drizzle. So come to Blue Hill and get a coffee drink. Sorry, it's really foggy. Come get a coffee drink that's fit for Elvis. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's a great Monday morning. Great to see you here and be a part. How's you doing, Swoo? Oh, that's sweet. Come on. How you doing, Swoo? There we go. In case you haven't heard, we have record enrollment this semester. We broke all of our records and have record enrollment of students. Give yourselves a hand. That's a great praise. Now, we have plenty of room in chapel for everyone, but it does make it a little tight. And so to help out, we're roping off some of the rows in the back so that people will come in and sit down front. Then we will move the ropes uh, when it gets close to the time so that people can come in. I ask you to be respectful of that, not you know move the ropes yourself and go in and sit down. So they can help us out so everybody can find a seat and so everybody can be comfortable. And uh, that is just great. But it's wonderful to know that we've broken another record uh, 399 is where we had always been, uh, the highest record of on-campus living and residence, and we're well over that. And then I think that our total enrollment is somewhere just short of 800, something in that, a high 700s. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So give yourselves another hand for that. That's great. Well, we begin spiritual emphasis today. Tom Harding, senior pastor for Alive Westland, will be sharing with us this morning, tonight at 7.30. Remember, Tuesday morning we have chapel 1050, no 1050 classes. So come on back here in the, tonight and then in the morning. Yep, somebody giving a shout out for no classes at 1050. That's great. And, um, and then tomorrow evening and ending out on Wednesday morning with chapel. We're also uh, very happy to have Josh Lavender Band. They're the ones that are going to be leading us in our music and our time of singing and worship. And so uh, it's just going to be a great time of seeing what the Lord has for us, of finding freedom in our relationship with Him. And so this is a great and wonderful day. The Lord is here to speak to you or to speak to your neighbor. And so this is a day that we should be happy and joyful because the Lord is going to speak and we're going to hear. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for these people who have come to work in our vineyard for a while. We pray, Lord, we've prayed beforehand. We know that you have come before us and that you are here to meet us. And Lord, today, tonight, tomorrow, tomorrow night, Wednesday, throughout the semester, you're going to change hearts and lives. You're going to make us into the people you want us to be. And that you are going to have your rightful place as the king and that you are the King of glory. And we want to sing that to you, proclaim who you are. And so, Lord, today we come expectant, lifting our voices, offering our hearts to you, Christ, our King. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. We're glad to be here with you. My name is not Josh Lavender. Josh will be with us tonight. He's flying in this afternoon, but we're the Josh Lavender Band, and we're excited to be with you. Would you stand with us as we begin this morning in worship? Would you put your hands together? To the King of glory and light, all praises to the only giver of life. A maker, 
the gates are open wide we worship you come see what love has done amazing he bought us with his blood our savior the cross is overcome we worship you come on southern ones and sing it out shout hosanna jesus he saves shout hosanna he rose from the grave come and lift him up we win the Now let the lost be found, forgiven. Death could not hold him down, he's risen. So let the saints cry out, we worship you, we worship you. Come on! Shout, Hosanna, Jesus he saves. Shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave. Come and lift him up, Hosanna. Sing out the same power. The same power that rolled the stone away. The same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we call upon your name. No other name. Let's sing that again. The same power. The same power that rolled the stone away. The same power alive in us today. King Jesus, we call upon your name. No other name. Give it a shout. Come on. Shout. Hosanna. Jesus, he saves. Shout. Hosanna. He rose from the grave. Hosanna, shout, Hosanna, Jesus, he saves, shout, Hosanna, he rose from the grave, come and lift him up, Hosanna, come and lift him up, Hosanna, come and lift him up, Hosanna. praise this morning. Amen. We've come to worship with you. We hope that you'll sing out. The whole point of worship is to ascribe worth, to give worth to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's what we want to do this next song. We say, Christ is risen from the grave. Would you lift him up? Let's do that together. Death by death, 
Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Trampling over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave And oh, death, where is your sting? victory you know church come stand in the light the glory of God has defeated the night sing it oh death where is your sting come oh hell where is your victory Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come away, come away, come and rise from the Would you pray with me? Lord God, we come before you this morning as one body just rejoicing for what you've done. You are our maker, our sustainer. You are the reason why we're here. And we just come before you and say, you are the one who saves Hosanna, praise be to you and to you alone. Not only for what you've done, but just for who you are, Lord. We thank you for your great love that's for each and every one of us. And we hope that something that is said or something that is sung this morning will change us because you are here. And we're just so thankful for you. We praise you in your name. Amen. You may be seated. Try your best. 
this, but you don't succeed When you get what you want, but not what you need When you feel so tired, but you can't sleep Stuck in Father, thank you so much for the morning, and um, man, just the high honor of being in this place with these incredible people. Thank you for <clears throat> the worship that has already been lifted in such a gifted, talented, spiritually sensitive way, and pray now, Lord, that you would um, move not just in my heart as the one who will proclaim the word this morning, but you would move in the hearts of those of us who will listen today, and that... Um, This is an event in such a way, Lord, that we decide whether or not we let you in any deeper than you currently are. And we come into a chapel like this, and there's so many distractions and thoughts of the day and details of the day, and I ask, Lord, if it would be in your plan that you would see fit to overwhelm us this week with your presence. I boldly pray, Lord, for a spirit of repentance and a spirit of courage and faith to run across this campus in such a way that the next great move of God begins here. I pray for those folks who are living double lives that they would find the freedom of a single life. I pray for those of us living with hypocrisy or self-righteousness that we would be set free in being the humble beggar asking for bread. Hide me now on your cross, I pray, in order that you might receive the greatest amount of glory possible in your name. Amen. Man, so honored to be with you all today. Uh, This is my roots. These are my roots. This is where I was trained and uh, met my wife and uh, all that many, 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 many years ago. And so just an honor to come and to be part of this uh, service with you. And thank you to my brother Ken for inviting me to come and be a part. Now, this is going to be a little strange because this morning I'm basically going to give you an introduction. And then the rest of the week I'm going to give you the rest of the sermon. So this morning's all introductory material, and you'll know after this morning what it is we're going to talk about for the next couple of days together. And so um, not your typical message where I say, hey, listen to this story about Jesus, and here's some truth from it. But what I want to do this morning is kind of get a little um, autobiographical with you and share a little bit about a struggle in my life, and just to get very real with you about that struggle. And uh, I, I've never given any of these messages before. They're all brand new. They're what God laid on my heart for this group of people for this time. And so I asked you to kind of treat me with that sort of grace as you hear the message this morning. Um, I, I, I have a question that has sort of been my nemesis, I guess, to be honest, for most of my life. And, um, and, and I still will have to tell you that the question still sort of haunts me. Don't get me wrong, I have an answer to the question, it's just not a great answer to the question. And to get at the question I, I want to ask you, I have to tell you a story. And the story goes all the way back to what I remember as a boy and going to what's called a state fair. Any state fair people out there, you know what a state fair is? And depending on the state you grew up in, that would depend on the weird factor at the state fair. And so the state fair is filled with rides, and like there's barns with cows in it, and there's funnel cakes, and there's all these different kinds of stuff. But the reason that I loved going to state fair as a boy was because of the weirdos. Because there was going to be a weirdo, if there's ever going to be a weirdo, there's going to be a weirdo at the state fair. And so I remember one particular state fair because the weirdos there were Christian weirdos. Now, I'm a young boy, so I don't have any, any, any sense about what I should be doing and shouldn't be doing. But all I remember was that there were these state fair weirdo Christians. And I'm not talking necessarily about 
the insane Westboro Baptist weird stupidity stuff, but I, I'm talking about basically people who dressed a little differently than, than most people in society, and, and they, they wore their hair up in this little kind of a bun, like a sock had been rolled over their hair, something up here, and they had these long skirts that hid their ankles because apparently their ankles are incredibly sexy, and people would be, people would be turned on by their ankle bones, you know. And so they had to keep those covered, or maybe because they didn't like to shave. I don't know what the situation was, but all I remember was they were long. And the men, they were balding, and they had these deep red cheeks with broken blood vessels and had these huge uh, uh, bellies of some sort that hid their belt buckle and, and everything else down there. And they kind of had this kind of moment, you know, where they were just kind of all around, and they were kind of moving. And, and if there was a stereotype for snake-handling Christians, this was, the, the, it was these people. These people were up there on the weird factor. Now, as a kid, I wasn't, I wasn't that bright. And, and as an adult, really, I'm not really that bright either. But, but, but I, I, I didn't know that I was supposed to avoid the weird Christians at the state fair. And so I got a box of popcorn, and, man, I walked right up to them, and I was just watching these guys do their little weird thing at the state fair. It was amazing. I was just watching these guys do their little thing and telling all these different kinds of stories. And, and, and immediately became apparent, man, these people, there's some, there's some angry people here. You know, I was eating the popcorn and enjoying myself, and they're like yelling this turn or burn kind of stuff. And they hand out these little pieces of paper, which another freebie from the state for I grabbed one and had all these people that were like black shadows. And there was this place that was kind of filled with fire and evil and meanness and stuff and everything horrible with Justin Bieber. All this stuff was... All this stuff was over there in the picture, you know, and so, and so all this was happening, and it was just, it was great. I was loving it. I was like, man, this is the best place ever. And so I was watching all this unfold, and then the ringleader, Apostle Zedekiah, or Lord Voldemort, depending on what your generation is, <laughs> he saw me there eating my popcorn, minding my own business. I'm just a little kid. I got a little propeller on my beanie cap. I'm just a little kid. And so he locks eyes with me, and he leans toward me, and he spit as much as he said, if you were to die today, that's kind of what he sounded like, do you know where you would spend eternity, boy? Now, I'm a young kid, and so I pretended like I didn't hear him. You know, I just kind of, <laughs> I'm just there for the popcorn and the weirdos. And then he says, you, boy. If you were to die today, do you know where you would spend eternity? Now, to be honest, at first I was a little offended he called me boy. You don't call an alligator a lizard, do you? <laughs> you know, what do you mean you're calling me boy? <laughs> but anyway, he, he did. And, 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 and to be honest, I was scared. There, I was there to watch the weirdos, not talk to them, and certainly not become one. But I'd been to the altar as a kid. In fact, I'd been several times. Anytime there's an altar call, I'm going just in case I need to clear something up. And, and my dad was a pastor, so I was kind of aware of spiritual things. So I say to the guy, yeah, I think I'd go to heaven. To which Apostle Zedekiah spewed back, how do you know, you heathen boy? And I'm assuming he thought I was heathen because I was wearing shorts. And he was a... He might have been a little flattered by my ankle bones. I don't know, but. So I said, well, um, I gave my heart to Jesus, and he forgave me for my sins. That's how I know. Are you sure? Do you know without a doubt? Well, I did before you asked me that. I felt, I felt pretty good. And, and, and he, says, he went on to say, the world is going to hell, boy, and you might be going with it. And at this point, Apostle Zedekiah was sort of freaking me out. So I started to back away, and he kept shouting at me. The weirdos kept shouting at me to give my heart for Jesus. And so luckily, my older brother had taught me a one-finger blessing, which I just kind of gave him as I was sort of backing away. Now today, I'm 48 years old. And that interaction probably happened over 35 years ago before any of you were born except for you slow students. Now do you know... <clears throat> of which I am one, so do you know that today I can still muster up all the emotions, the sights, and the smells of that encounter with that man? I can still picture the little vein in Apostle Zedekiah's cheeks. 
I see the big black leather Bible that was well-worn that he was shaking at me. And a couple of things marked me that day. Uh, the first thing is, is, what, is that if that's what it means to follow God, then to be honest, I want nothing to do with that. If this is what God's love looks like, I don't need it. And if these people were sharing the love of Christ, it looked a whole lot like fear and anger to me. And so I decided I didn't want whatever he had. But it's really the second thing that marked me that day. That's the reason I kind of tell you that story. And to be honest with you, it's what we're going to talk about for the entire week we're together. It's the second thing that leads to the questions that I want to go after in all these services together. I walked away from Apostle Zedekiah with these two questions. Do I have a relationship with God? And if so, what does it look like? That question haunted me for some time as a believer because there is a period of my life that I suspect some of you are in right now where I wasn't a Christian. I mean, I was raised in a Christian home, but I certainly rejected what it, all that I was taught at that period of my life. I, I didn't care about Jesus. I didn't care about any pastor or any worship. I certainly didn't care about the Bible. I never read the thing. And, and I didn't, didn't care about church. Sunday was sleep in, morning time, and all that kind of stuff. And so if you were to ask me at that point in my life, hey, Tom, do you have a relationship with, your, with God? I would say, no, I don't. Maybe someday, but not today. Today I don't have a relationship with God. And then there were these other periods of my life where maybe some of you would find yourself where I sort of backburnered the whole faith, the faith questions. Um, I, if I figured if I could keep it on the back burner but still on the stove, then I could do what I wanted to do with my life and I could act the way that I wanted to act. Now, if you were to ask me at that point, hey, Tom, do you have a relationship with God? I would say, yes. I, I gave my heart to Jesus when I was a boy. But I was also doing a lot of things in my life that I knew weren't pleasing to Jesus. And so in a situation like this or whatever, I sort of felt a little two-faced. And then there's a the period of my life where I would say I'm at now. I've decided that I'm going to spend all the time that I have left on this planet in this full bore, sold out the whole route kind of relationship with God. I believe there's an afterlife. And I further believe that how I live my life today impacts whatever comes next in that life. And I believe Jesus died for my sins and he offers me forgiveness. Don't get me wrong, I, I don't want to pretend like I have all these answers. I, I really don't. I have a lot of questions, to be quite honest. But because I believe Jesus died for my sins and he's the only thing that I've discovered that could actually give me freedom and from guilt, shame kind of things... I, I now live my life for him. And, and, and this has been my life fairly consistently now for the last, over three, last three decades or so. But, but here's my secret. And it's my own little embarrassment, so I just thought I'd share it with a thousand random strangers. <clears throat> I... I still live with constant attention and constant searching in that relationship with God. And don't misunderstand me. I, I don't wonder if I have a relationship with God, and, and I'm not afraid of where I go when I die. That, I'm afraid of how I'm going to get there, but I'm not afraid of where I'm going to go once I, once I get there. But my questions have more to do with this life my searching has more to do with this deep desire to know God and to know Him intimately. I don't want to know what some guy up in front of us is talking about. I don't want to know what they know about God. I want to know God intimately. I know I have a Savior. I don't doubt that. I know Jesus died for me, and I, I've settled all that. But my questions have to do with the Lord part. What does it mean for Tom to live as somebody who serves his Lord and how do I know where I am in my relationship with God? So if you were to ask me, Tom, do you have a relationship with God? How do I know how to answer you? And if you said, Tom, 
what does your relationship with God look like? What am I supposed to say to that? Or if I were to ask you that question. Now, it's at this point in the message maybe that some of you might decide to sort of check out. But before you do that, let me, let me kind of tell you why that question's important to me. And again, I apologize for being so autobiographical here, but um, I, I just wanted to come clean with you in some ways so you'll understand a little bit of the heart behind where we're going this week. I, I'm, a, I'm a husband, and I'm married to the most fantastic woman in the world for the last 27 years. And if there's anyone on the planet that I want to love well, it's my wife, Lisa. Lisa. And yet, over our relationship, there have been countless times when we came to our own end as a married couple. We came to the end of our ropes in our relationship right after medical school. She's a physician in residency. We honestly wondered then if our relationship was going to survive. And we had two young kids at that time. And neither one of us will ever forget the day we stood in the driveway wondering how we were going to move forward and wondering if it would be best if we just kind of divided everything up and went different directions. And some of you come from a situation just like that. And, and there were times in our relationship where the finances were so tight that we had to pray that there'd be enough gas in our car so she could get to work. Now, I say all that to say the only option that we found as one who's just ahead of the journey for some of you, the only option that we found in a moment like that as we were looking at the people that we pledged to say, I do and love forever, the only option we found in the driveway was God. Because the human element wasn't enough. Allow me just to go a little bit deeper. I have three wonderful kids. And kids don't come with manuals or textbooks. You can't. And you get them, and then you have to teach them how to survive the world. And you have to teach them what's right and what's wrong. And your voice is going to be different than every other voice they hear. We've just come through 9-11 anniversary. I realize a good many of you don't remember that day very well. Some of you will. But I'll never forget the events of the day and because we all understood as a nation that things changed forever that day. We realized we were vulnerable. But what really got me was when my oldest kid, who was four, she comes home from daycare and she said that one of the kids in her class had told her Saddam Hussein was coming to kill her. And she was afraid. See, when your kid has a self-esteem issue, or your kid's being picked on at school, or your kid's questioning life, this is what I know. You can take it for what it's worth. But you will run out of a place to turn. And you will come to your own wit's end. Last year, this very week, my second oldest kid, I told you, are everybody okay? Everybody okay? My second oldest kid, she was in kidney failure. She's a cross-country runner, and so we had just finished running a race down in Columbia, and she ran her PR, which is personal record. But immediately following that race, she lost energy in a way that we had never seen before. She was bedridden. Not, not bedridden, but chair-ridden, and wasn't able to leave the house due to physical exhaustion. She had to turn her uniform back into the cross-country team within two weeks. And we started seeking out all this medical care. People started bringing books to the house to teach her because of the school she was missing. 
And we went to this countless specialist. And all the while, I'm pastoring a church and Lisa's medical people, caring for people, and we're continuing our lives. But all these countless specialists, they all said the exact same thing. Something's wrong, but we have no idea what it is. And just to be, to be honest, and I try not to be overly dramatic, but we went, we went through six months there, and there was this period of time where my wife honestly thought my daughter was dying. And I will never forget standing in our bedroom, holding one another, just weeping. Now, God took us through all of that, and today, um, she's actually better. She ran the same race this past weekend down in Columbia. And it ended up being some sort of virus that was in her body, and the only reason they identified that was because of an antibody that they found in her blood. Right now, she's in this advanced class at high school. And the teacher's an anti-Christian guy. He recently bashed pastors to the entire class, knowing that her dad was a pastor. And she came home, and she wondered what it is she should do. I taught her the one-finger blessing my older brother taught me when I was a boy. Let me ask you a question. Where are you going to turn when my story becomes like your story? What is it you have planned? What are you going to do? I'm a pastor. My wife's a physician. We are blessed people. But we often meet people at the crisis moment in their lives. Last week, my wife visited a 43-year-old lady who's having hospice come in because the cancer is going to kill her. What would you say? Come on. Don't bail on me. Engage with me on this. What are you planning on saying? Because that time is coming. I've counseled a couple who recently discovered the other ones had multiple affairs. And the home is devastated, and so are the two kids. But their futures had a bomb dropped on it. There was a time when the weight and ministry of the church I currently serve and the critiques of the public that I was trying to reach were so great that I thought my psyche had broken. If that's possible, I don't know. And as we deal with these situations and others that are more serious, Lisa and I have often come to the end of our own strength and had to lean hard into this relationship with God because God stopped being a game. And let me just say respectfully, this is now on you. This is in this generation right now. Every one of us saw the pictures that came across the screens of the little Syrian boy who washed upon a shore. What are you going to say to that? What is your plan Because it is our responsibility, and this is our world. Syria is being overrun by ISIS, and people, families just like yours, just like mine, are being forced from their homes because of a fanatical religious sect who's completely intolerant of those who believe differently than than they do. Last night, 60 Minutes featured a story about this, and do you realize that ISIS is routinely destroying hundreds of thousands of Christian texts from the first century, the same century in which Jesus lived and taught? They are the ultimate bully group. What are you planning on saying? I know it's intense. Let me get a little more intense, and then I'll finish. For me, at this point in my life, I no longer care what everybody's opinion is on any issue I've mentioned. Everybody seems to be an expert, and yet nobody seems to have any answers, at least as I see it. I don't want to hear what the liberals or the conservatives or the Democrats or the Republicans have to say. I don't want to hear what young people say. I don't want to hear what old people have to say. I really don't. What what I want to know, not as a pastor, 
But just as a man, what I want to know is what would God say to all those situations I mentioned? Don't you want to know that? I could care less what Trump or Clinton said about anything. What I want to know is what is God going to say? And I don't share all this to bring you down, although I realize I've effectively done that. I share it to let you know this, that my relationship with God has moved from the time when I sat in a seat like you're sitting in where God was an option, and it has moved into the category of God being an essential in my life. I'm not sowing wild oats. I'm not pretending like I'm a Christian here and then doing something totally different on Friday night. (laughs) I'm not trying to be the big man on campus. I realize I'm not going to be the star of the team, so I don't have to live up to that sort of identity. I'm not the life of the party, and I'm not trying to discover who I am. What I am is this. I'm a husband, a father, and a pastor who at times is scared to death, and I need God. I'm part of what they call Generation X. I was a little miffed that that was the name that came up for us, but nonetheless, that's what they called us. And it's folks who are born in the 60s through the mid-70s. And as you look around at the leaders of the world, most of them would fit into that category or just the one just before. When Generation X was coming out, on the scene, we had a prophet sort of sorts who did a lot of writing, kind of describing what was going to characterize my generation of people. Your parents, I suspect, at least most of you. And our prophet, was his name was Douglas Copeland. And we all read Douglas Copeland's stuff to try to, he was like the voice of our generation. And he wrote this best-selling novel that did the New York Times and all that kind of stuff. stuff. But the novel was entitled, Life After God. Because what he taught was that it was going to be my generation that raised a generation of people that said, you don't need God. He believed that I would raise my children in a home and we would create a culture and create a a country in which God was an afterthought, almost a post-Christian era. And so we were all reading him to kind of see where we were going to go, and the book was a reflection on that kind of society, what that society would look like when God was no longer mainstream, no longer accepted, no longer tolerated, and no longer lived after with conviction. Copeland believed that's where Generation X would lead us to a society a society that becomes intolerant of God. And I want to let you know, Copeland was eerily accurate on what he taught. In his book, Life After God, he tracks a young man through a troubled era. The young guy's remorseful about his mistakes, and his marriage was stagnated, and he's ensnared in this meaningless job. And instead of Instead of these deep friendships, he endures what he calls halfway relationships, which we would now call Facebook today. And he's worried he doesn't feel the way he used to, and he peers into the future with uncertainty. But then after 358 pages of the book, Life After God, listen, listen. After 358 pages of the book, Life After God, of aimlessness and frustration, this is his conclusion. And he says this, now here is my secret. I tell it to you with an openness of heart that I doubt I shall ever achieve again. So I pray that you are in a quiet room as you read these words. My secret is that I need God that I am sick and can no longer make it alone. I need God to help me give because I no longer seem to be capable of giving, to help me be kind as I no longer seem capable of kindness, to help me love as I seem beyond being able to love. Like Copeland's character, 
Maybe some of you have a secret too. Perhaps your own circumstances are causing you to conclude that maybe, just maybe, you need God as well. You need God to breathe hope and life into your world. Or maybe you need him to knock the crust off a heart that's corroded with self-interest and cynicism. Or maybe you need him to break through the duality of your life where you pretend you're one person here, but you're another person there. Or maybe you need him to heal up some of the brokenness, like the stories that I shared, but even far worse. Maybe you need him to touch your sexuality. Maybe you need him to touch some of the mistakes you made in your life sexually. And some of you, maybe you're kind of like me, the little kid. I know I need him. I'm just not sure why. Or maybe some of you are so astute in the room and I pray to God you are, that you just sense that there's got to be more to your existence than a job and an income and three meals a day and the gnawing feeling that something's missing inside of you. And you'd like to get at the truth, but you're not sure how, and you're a little afraid of what you might find. Or maybe some of you tried this truth, but you couldn't hold it and you're afraid to try it again. Now, I don't know if you believe in the Bible being the Word of God. I do. If you do, I think it's important for you to hear what the Bible says about this relationship with God business. Jeremiah said, I know the plans I have for you in the book of Jeremiah. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That sounds like a God that has a relationship with me. The Gospel of John. He was in the world, and through the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Watch this. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then there's that one in Revelation chapter 3 where it says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, watch this. This is God. I come in and eat with him and he with me. And so it's with that heart and that introduction to this evening, I just want to ask you to think about those two questions today. Do you have a relationship with God? And if so, what does it look like? That's what we're going to talk about this week. Lord, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for these beautiful people. Thank you for their sensitivity to me and to this conversation this morning. And now, Lord, as we prepare to head to our classes and whatever the new Elvis drink, whatever we have going I pray you would mark our hearts right now, all of us. Mark our hearts. Let it be a conversation in the lunchroom. Let it be a conversation coffee shop. Do you have a relationship with God? And if so, what does it look like? And use these services, I pray, not only to change lives here, but to change this world. In your name, amen. Thank you for your hospitality. You all dismissed.